Lay. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Kane is in the building. Yeah. It's alright, already the show goes on all night. Uh. Till the morning we dream so long. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever wonder when they will see the sun? Just remember when you come up. Welcome to My Big Red Couch. Today, obviously, I am not on My Big Red Couch. I'm here in Barbados with Devani Morris, known as one of the most in influential music business executives in the Caribbean. Ronnie got his start in the music industry at a very early age, the tender age of 12, where you were a runner-up in uh, Richard Stout Teen Talent, talent competition. competition. You've been a finalist in the Party Marnet competition. Yes. Ronnie is a male model. I love male models. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he placed fifth out of 50 um, contestants in the Mr. World competition back in 2003 in London. Yes. Ronnie is um, one of the principals of Gold Coast Records. He is the founder and director of Barbados Music Awards. He's also part of the management team for Superstar um, Regina, Regina Bell. Bell and he has so many different things that he has under his belt at the tender age of 33 I'm just so <laughs> amazed by all the things that you have done and I really wanted to come home and start my kind of like my series that I'm going to be doing on Barbadians because obviously you people know by now that I'm from Barbados even though so many people are so surprised when they hear my Barbados accent <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to start with you because I, I just admire your drive, your ambition, and Thank I'm you. so. I just want to briefly talk about Barbados Music Awards. It's one of the most prestigious um, awards shows in the Caribbean, and that's really saying something. I wanted to ask you, what made you think that there was a need in Barbados for an event of such a, um, of such caliber? When I was um, active in the music industry at a very very young age. I, I remember getting this award from Dame Nita Barrow when mm -hmm. I was 13. Yes. And this was the UNICEF Award of Excellence. Yes. And um, she was the Governor General of Barbados at the time. Mm -hmm. But between the age of 13 and 26, I didn't see any real event or occasion where artists were recognized, recognized. at that level. Mm -hmm. And we had Rupi, who at the time had a top 40 Billboard single. He was the first Barbadian to have a top 40 song on the top 100 chart on Billboard. And there was the emergence of Rihanna. But Rupi really, I would say, was the one who, who really inspired the, the, the debut of the BMA because his achievement was so huge to me. Because I never thought I would see a Barbadian on the Billboard chart. Mm -hmm. At least not in the top part of the Hot 100. So when I saw that, I had the idea when I was 23, when I was coming back from London for Mr. World. But that made me decide, well, I have to do this and do it now. Okay, and were there any... Did you experience any roadblocks, any resistance or anything to, to form and you know, to start in this? Well, really, when I first started the Barbados Business Board, no one knew that I was doing it. Ah. My business partner knew, and um, I remember mentioning it at a time to a government official who, you know, we had a short meeting, and the person said, you know, that would never fly, that's not going to happen. And we didn't yeah. get any support from that entity. But the, the then Prime Minister, Owen Arthur, he was extremely supportive. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know um, anything about my background. But he attended the event, and, and he, he consented to be patron. He attended the event, and then after the event, he met with me, and we went through a whole plan for the Barbados Music Awards. And, and where it wasn't always tangible, it was very supportive. He attended every year, and all of the ministers attended, and they presented from Dame Billy Miller to Mia Motley. And, and I think that gave the event the prestige that to take had. off in okay. the early stages. And that continued with, with um, the late David Thompson, who okay. also was patron and attended the event. So it always had that, that state kind of um, support. Okay. And it had the support of Barbadian entertainers from the get-go. So we had, for instance, in the first year, you would have had Lil Rick in the same room and Sister Marshall in the same room as yeah. Rihanna and Rupi and Alison Hines and Edwin and the Merry Men and everybody there. And that had never been seen before. So that's how we really got that kickstart. Amazing. So you would save that from, um, from conception to inception because you had this idea from the time you were like 23. So how long did it take, you know? Um, I had the idea at around 23. 
and then I stopped thinking about it for about two years. And then when I really came off of the international modeling circuit, because I actually was traveling as a model, I did a lot of stuff, you know, in Europe. And, and the last international event I did was in Aruba. Okay. For e Entertainment Television. It was the International Male Model Search, where they choose the top male models in the world and put them to compete. And down there, I, I was saying I was gonna I was gonna re retire from the industry. I was 24. I, I did a lot. Retire from the industry at yeah. 24. <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot at the time. And you feel really old really quickly in, in fashion. In fashion, yes. And um, I was thinking, am I gonna do this in my 30s? So, you know, to, to, to really to really hit it home, I think that that coming off of that circuit and coming back home, I, I had to, to to get involved in doing this, and that's really where. You know, the, the, the plan took seed in 2003. It was on layaway for two years. <laughs> like and that. then, like, four months before it actually happened, happened. Mm -hmm. that was the implementation phase. Okay. Well, good. And I'm, I'm glad that you did have a... Because briefly before we started our interview, we were talking about being ambitious and having drive. But then if you don't have the support that you need, like you said, mm -hmm. there are many ideas are dead in the water. So I'm really dead. glad that you did have that. And it's grown. And this is its seventh year? That was year? actually just the ninth. This we just had the ninth. Yes, oh my god, <laughs> yes. So, this is the 10th year anniversary. We're approaching now 10 years, mm -hmm. and so I'm sure that you have some really good stuff in store. The 10th is going to be incredible if, if the support is there. If, if the support is we, there, we've had, we've had um, discussions with, with icons to perform at the Barbados Music Awards. We've had, we've been very, very close to booking Janet Jackson. Um, that year, we were going to Kenston Oval, but then we, we changed it to Garfield Sober Gymnasium last minute. And that would have been the seventh Barbados Music Awards. Okay. Um, you know, we would have had Sissy Houston, Joseph Jackson, that kind of thing. So having had Joseph Jackson, it made it easy to, to negotiate with Janet's people. So we still want to bring Janet. Okay. I don't know if it's going to happen for the 10th one. Um, but certainly, Rihanna, we're going to target uh, a Barbadian headliner for the 10th. Oh, that would Music be Award. amazing. That would be really wonderful. So that's the, the dream. And I mentioned that you were one of the, one, were one of the principals for Gold Coast Records. And again, I'm going to ask you, why did you decide that you wanted to have a record company? Because mm -hmm. is there another record company here in Barbados, or would you be the first? Is there, there are others. others? Um, more so recording studios who, who record and yes. release. Okay. But I wanted to have a, a label. I think CRS would have been the first. Okay. Or the most modern in our time. In the 60s and the 70s, you had world, world records. Yes. And mm -hmm. they, they did extremely well with the likes of Wendy Allen and... and um, the Opels and the Draytons and them. But then in my lifetime, I've never seen that. So it would have been CRS that I would have looked at as a record label or Carib Disc Records. Okay, and again, I'm going to ask you, why did you see the need to have this because, here in the Caribbean? Because I think those labels, um, they had very specific artist rosters. So you had world records dealing with Spooge and, and that, that era and some, some gospel reggae kind of calypso. And then you had CRS really focus on Calypso and Reggae. So you would have had um, Spice, the Merry Men mm -hmm. within CRS. And I thought that there was a need for a record label to handle R&B, pop, gospel, jazz, hip hop. Okay, so can you tell me just a couple of the artists that you, um, that are part that of, work with? Yeah, that you work with? Mm -hmm. I have Tony Norville that I manage yeah. completely. Um, we do bookings for Regina Bell, Fantasia, En Vogue, Stephanie Mills. And we have a development deal going on with several Barbadian artists, okay. including Most Wanted, who signed to us. And they, if you're familiar with the Barbadian market, they perform that reggae on the beach every year for the last okay. seven years. And we have a hip hop artist called Nitro. Mm. He's an awesome artist. We just re-signed him. And his album is going to be out next month. We have um, Vision, who we do bookings for. Okay. And he just won uh, several awards. He's in the United States as we speak. Just okay. recorded with Tone Mason. That's the production team behind Jay-Z and Drake. And, you know, Vision's been doing some work with them. So we have some stuff going on in terms of artists. But Gold Coast does a lot of event production as well. I realized, we, I realized that. I was just, because I, you know, I went, as I was researching you and seeing all the stuff that you did, I tried to, you know, go to your website. And obviously, so I'm really impressed with all the stuff. Thank I keep you. I keep saying that. And I'm always impressed with people who are doing, who are actually doing it instead of just saying it. <laughs> so, you know, people can talk or whatever, yeah. but then you, you, you got to walk the walk. And I really, truly think that you are walking the walk. 
Thank so, you very much. You know, and you know, from the Barbados. <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the major, major changes that you've seen since you started mm -hmm. in the music and entertainment industry, um, both locally and internationally? I think that there's the emergence of, um, of the younger executives. You, you, see a lot of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see a lot of producers operating at home, and those producers go on to sell millions of records. And record labels are not what they used to be. Okay. So independent labels now are selling millions of records on their own. So you find a lot of um, powerful young black people emerging in the industry, which was dominated before by Caucasian executives. And I think the diversity is the major change I've seen. I think that in Barbados, though, there needs to be a real serious effort behind the music industry. There's a lot of talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, I find sometimes it's, it's used almost, like it's used for particular purposes, and then it's dropped after. And I think that, that, that really it should not be used when persons want For to achieve their own personal goals. Exactly. But um, the, the support should continue thereafter. And I think the music industry, it is known, for instance, if you're trying to sell anything, you get an entertainer to sell it. Yes. So when I was working with McInerney, and we, we had the, the Kia Serato campaign, the uh -huh. entertainers drove that campaign, resulting in, in millions of dollars in sales. Um, Lil Rick when he was with Guinness, the sales were incredible. When he moved to Mackeson, they became the number one in the market. So it shows that the entertainers really have the power to, to, to communicate and connect with the, the audience, the mm -hmm. buying public. Of course. So therefore, I think the lack of investment is appalling to me. Where, where you have, you know that these persons have the connection. The, 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 the thousands of people follow and their you know that move. they can drive sales for you. They can drive sales, mm -hmm. but you don't invest in them. So you give them some change to do a commercial, but you don't tangibly invest in them properly to really develop them. So I think it's kind of um, unfair when you really look at it. And I think those are the changes I would like to see. Okay. But the changes I've seen, not really that many. Here in, here in Barbados. And worldwide, I think, I think some entertainers make more from touring now. But in terms of making money from the recording aspect of the industry, I think people make less money. So I think that there's a need to, to look back at what was there in the 80s and the 70s and try to understand what they did and how we can reconnect with that and then develop again. Because I think there's, a, there's a somewhat of a, a misstep going on. And what's your vision for the future of the music industry here in Barbados? Here I would like to see government very actively supporting the music industry. Um, we know just yesterday heard that the, the cruise industry is, is in trouble because the ships are not using the revenue to come this far south. Mm. So they're going up to Bahamas, Jamaica, and the Northern Caribbean, and, and that's the route they're, they're choosing now. So if we see that there's, there's a sector that is not performing how we expect, or that we can look down the road and see that the, the revenue is going to dip or nose dive. I think that we should diversify and see that the entertainment industry has the potential to bring the money to the island. And it does. Rihanna alone generates more money than the sugar industry in Barbados every year. And that money goes to the United States. So therefore, we need to find a way where we can capture the talent here, develop it, and export it. And I don't think that there, there's a serious effort to do so. Well, that is very interesting. Um, because I, I was speaking with someone and they, you know, they said that, um, which is so interesting, that Barbados no longer ha is no longer sea and sand, mm -hmm. you know, kind of destination. So you have right. to have, you know, open up to different things. So it's really yes. interesting that you do say that because mm -hmm. they were suggesting um, things like um, sports tourism and stuff like that. I have to do it. So, you know, really, really, because a lot of people have those same ideas and but the powers that be are not in agreement so to speak uh, or, I, they, or they don't see it or you know they can't see the vision for it i can tell you that as, as an athlete because i used to run that was my <laughs> passion before passion you know, okay. that was my thing i was an athlete um but an injury stopped me from taking a scholarship okay in, in track and field doing sprints and hurdles and i know for a fact that if the correct names in track and field are attracted to barbados um, 
it would have benefits for tourism. So for instance, if you had a stadium that could seat 20,000 people, and you did three or four major meets a year, and you had Usain Bolt and Ronnie Campbell's running here, the tourists would come. Athletics is a bigger sport globally than cricket. But we, we are stuck onto cricket, but we don't realize that the Caribbean now is making more of an impact in athletics than cricket. Than cricket. Because the Jamaicans are the biggest um, market for track and field. Jamaica, Bahamas, Trinidad is getting there. And if we do a Grand Prix kind of circuit, people will come here to see it in, the, in their droves. So I think that that is the angle where sports and music, music. can marry. Because you can have halftime shows like the Super Bowl, and you can do that kind of thing where the tourists would come. A festival type atmosphere before and after track meets. But you put proposals to persons who, who are in the position to effect them, and you have to wait. wait. And then you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you just go and get a day job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of where it goes sometimes, especially for younger entrepreneurs. Um, there have been some really great collaborations between different musical artists. If yes. you could work with anyone, mm -hmm. who would it be? Right now? Right I, now. I would love to do a duet with Fantasia. Ooh. Believe it or not, I think that um, it would have been Whitney Houston, but she passed she away. She passed away. And I would love to do a duet with Fantasia. I would like to have said a Barbadian artist, but... I would want to have a situation where I'm pulled into the market and connect two markets. Exactly. And then it could pull along Barbadian artists with me. Exactly. Because um, obviously I love Alison Hines. Everybody knows she's one of my favorite artists. We're friends. She, she's an incredible human being. And we have had conversations before about things like her doing a song with Rihanna for Cup Over and Marshall and Rihanna collaborating. And I've spoken to Marshall's people. This is way back in like 2008. But for me, I would love to do a duet with Fantasia for sure. And, and, and I also saw that one of your dreams would be to win a Grammy. Yes. Yeah. And you I went back you, into the you, music you, business you. big time this year. Oh, wonderful. I've, um, I've been exercising. I've been writing songs. I've written about 40 songs recently. <laughs> and um, I have some labels in mind. And this Saturday, I'm actually auditioning for the Hilton to be a resident performer there. Hopefully that'll work. Oh, beautiful. And I'm going to use that to springboard into going back into recording and performing while they work with the label. Because I'm looking at what the others are doing, and all the labels are led by artists. So I'm thinking that that would be a good move to get back into the business. But I want to do a, a duet type project. Probably do a song with Regina, a song with Evan Campbell, people that I know. No, and you have a, a relationship yeah. with already, and which will make it And pull it together easier. and release it worldwide. That's oh, my beautiful. Aim. That's really, really great. And I see that you have your fingers in a lot of pies. I was looking, I see you have Camp Fest coming up yes. in June. There's a hip hop festival. The in 30th of March. In the hip -hop. We, have, we have 30 artists performing. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And you have a project that you started working on called Ronnie Morris Uncovered. Yes. And just tell us a little <laughs> bit, just a little bit about you know what that's about, because it's a little bit more in your face type yes. thing because I did watch the the first one and that's really what made me want to interview you. Oh, I did okay. I saw that on your Facebook page, you know, we Facebook rules the world, you know, <laughs> you know everything. I learned practically almost everything that I've asked you about on Facebook and you were actually performing with a close friend of mine. You know, I shouldn't say a close friend. I've known her since the time I was eleven, Paula Hines. Paula, you know, so yeah. you know, and I really wanted just to share a little bit about because I know that's something that you wanna Yes. Keep going. Yes. And so just tell us a little bit about that. Well, that's actually a step. I'll tell you a little bit before that. Okay. I was in Vegas um, for the last three years on and off. And I did some auditions and I had some meetings. I was actually in a meeting with a gentleman who, when, when I sang to him, he sat down in the room and he said, um, how much do you want? And it was my agent, who's Marcus Tennell, who lives in, in, in Vegas. Vegas okay. And we worked out a deal right there, which was, to my mind, mind-blowing. That was last year. And there was the, it was at the stage where, you know, we're looking at getting the work permit, deciding if to relocate or not, because you would have to relocate to take three years singing six nights a week mm. in, in, in the Vegas, market. Yeah. So I had actually decided that that's what I was going to do. And there okay. was some PR in Barbados and some media saying that I was going to Vegas to, to live and to, to perform. But then when I thought about the fact that my son was, was going into secondary school, because he passed the foundation last year. So you had him when you were two? <laughs> I know. 
<laughs> he turned 12 on the 12th of December 2012. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah, so we, for me, that was some hair coming. So I had to pass up that opportunity right there at that time. And then the second Carrot Fest was coming up this year. And to put it into perspective, Carrot Fest is going to be bigger than the Barbados Music Awards because it's a Caribbean Music Awards event. Okay. So Uncovered really was, okay, we're going to do this singing thing. There's this option or hold to perform in this massive city and make bank <laughs> or come home and, and develop the market here. So we thought we'd make a really good reality show. And I think that, that the background is going to be, the, the, the follow-up um, editions are much more revealing than the teaser. Yes. Much, much, much more revealing than the teaser. And you go, you go into meetings, you see the meetings, you see some follow-ups, you see some negotiations, you see um, high points, low points, tears, that kind of thing. It's really, 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 really revealing. So that's what we call it, Uncovered. Interesting. I was really intrigued with that because I'm always... I like reality mm -hmm. shows, but not all reality yeah, shows. Yeah, it's not going to be ratchet, though. No, it's not, and it's not <laughs> going to be. It's not going to be honey boo boo, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is your greatest accomplishment thus far? Accomplishment um, thus far. In music. Personally, you can personally business, music, whatever you want to share with me. I think personally is the birth of my son. Yes. Um, because he looks just like me. Ah, <laughs> My son is like, he so has he an amazing... A, so he must be a really good looking little dude, he, right? He's like, you know. Ooh. He has an incredible mother. Um, we're not together, but I think that, that the, the, the amount of time I spent trying to make this thing, this career happen, and she's just being very dedicated. We, we get along at strings like, well. We get along very, very well. We talk almost every day on the phone. Wonderful. Um, he comes here, we hang out sometimes. Not enough, though. And I think the greatest accomplishment is having a son who has been raised well. Kudos to his mother, I would say. And um, that I could see is going to, he sees me as a role model. And I think that the fact that he can see me as a role model is my biggest personal achievement. Because some that. people have kids and they can't look up to them. I love that, I love that. Right? So, um, and then the, the business, music wise, I would say is the Barbados Music Awards for sure. Okay. And. Professionally, other than that, I think the Mr. World competition was a real... Because when I did Mr. Barbados, I did the Ambassador's Gala Roots Experience Mr. Barbados. And I thought, well, that's good. I won the three of them. That's the end of the road for that, you know what I mean? And then when I went to Mr. World and I got there, there were two black contestants. There were 56 of us, but two were black. So 54 white guys, two black guys. Mm. And I was there saying, um, you know, like... <laughs> yeah. I'm in the minority. I know how this is going to turn out. Yes. <laughs> but the organization is so fair that from the beginning, I noticed that even in the rehearsals, when they were rehearsing the winners, they would call me up all the time. And then when we had the talent segment, which was done in like a small theater in, in the building, a room actually, they pulled us forward and said, what's your talent? What's your talent? And we did our talent thing. And they had a panel there, and I didn't know. Okay. But when it, when it was finished, some of the contestants dropped out the segment. And they were like, you know, give it to him, give it to him. And I won the best talent section. And I remember it distinctly the night in the Thistle Barbican Center. I wasn't supposed to sing the song at the final night. And the organizers came and they said, um, we called Elton John's people. And they gave you permission to sing the song. Because they sang Don't Let the Song Go Down on Me for the talent thing. Okay. I said permission to sing the song where? Like, I'm thinking, where? They said, do you have another suit? They said, I have another suit in my bag. Put it on, put it on, put it on. So I, they brought me out, and I had to open the show singing Elton John's song. And I didn't know that Elton John gave them permission for me to sing the song. So Amazing. then when I, when I finished the performance, it's when they announced that I won the Best Talent Award. So the whole night was surreal. Like you feel like you're dreaming. Dreaming, yeah. And then to get in the top ten was shocking for me. And then when they announced the top five, that was shocking for me. So I think the Mr. World competition really... Was my, yeah. Oh, wonderful. I love that. Sure. And what, what legacy do you want to leave behind, not only for your son, mm -hmm. obviously, but also for young up-and-coming performers, people who are thinking of getting into the, the um, management side of the business? Mm -hmm. What kind of legacy do you want to leave for them? I think that I want to create um, a path for Barbadian entertainers to, to 
to, to own homes and property and and to really establish themselves and to be respected. I think that that for us, it is a struggling situation for most entertainers. It doesn't look that way, but it's extremely difficult financially. And I think that that's a structure and system needs to be put in place. So if, if in what I'm doing in the industry, the government can see, well, there are these young people who are doing these things, there are these people who are trying this and that, and these are the results. Let's invest, let's open up the doors for them. And then the, the, the opportunities for them become easier in the future. I think that's the legacy one of these, that there were these trailblazers at this time who made it easier for them. Okay. So I think that's, it. that's the legacy. And for your son? I want, um, I want my son to be able to own the Warbidus Music Awards and to own Caribfest and to be the one who takes what I did to the next level and to employ people. I think that there's a, a real serious power in employing people because like, if one person can employ 20 people, we won't have unemployment, really. And I see it as, as an employer is someone who, who has a spiritual responsibility to help others. And I know that he has that, he's inherited that, that, that um, personality where he likes to help everybody around him. I love that. So I want him to, to, to see in me that he's not supposed to be selfish or greedy, but one to help other people. And, and, and one final question, and if there was a theme song for your life, what would it be? Never give up. I think um, Yolanda Adams has a song called Never Give Up. Okay. That when I hear it sometimes, there were times that I was going to sell the Barbados Music Awards for millions less than it was worth. Okay. I'm telling you that there was a stage where uh, I was frustrated to the point where there were people who were offering what they knew was not the price point for that event. And I was at a stage where I was saying, okay, cool, I'm gonna sell it and take it around with it and it would it would not have been in the Barbadians hand anymore. But then I think about people like Owen Arthur and what they believe in. Right. And the advice from people like Lynette Eastman and and they say, you know, like not not no, not at this time. I think it should remain in Barbadian hands. So I think that, that not giving up has made me stronger and able to, to tolerate more things. So I think that is my, I learned that from my mother though. Awesome. She's an awesome person. Awesome. I really want to thank you for allowing me into your space. Thank and you too, I really, <laughs> like I said, I really, really wanted to interview you because I think, and you know, you say that we, we discussed this about people not looking outside of their families for role models, but mm -hmm. you know, you're one person that if my sons had to look for role models, I would <laughs> like them to look, because I want them to be entrepreneurs, I want them to be, you know, everything that you are, I would Thank like my, son, my sons to be. And so that's, and I, that's, I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, like, you know, I don't like to cry because you know, I'm not really pretty when I cry. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you get emotional over certain things. So I really think that you're a, an amazing young per, young man, and you I much. wish you all the best. And I, I know I'm gonna see you winning that Grammy sometime in the future. That's for sure. Thank Definitely. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you sure. Thank you. And that's it for now. That's been this has been my big red couch, and I'll see you again sometime soon. <laughs>